Hey, everybody. Welcome back. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's 8.50 a.m. It's Wednesday, April 15th, um, and we're going to have the next lecture in our series today for Chapman, 9 to 9.50 a.m. Uh, class session, so hopefully you guys are comfortable. Getting started bright and early. Good morning to everyone. <clears throat> Just getting my notes prepared. All right, still got like about five minutes. <clears throat> Just hanging in here, waiting until 9 a.m. <clears throat> hey, kitty. Kitty. Mm -hmm. Cat's hanging out. Good morning, one and all. People are starting to trickle in. <clears throat> I 
Good morning. <clears throat> Welcome back. <clears throat> Good to see you guys. Rise and shine, everybody. <clears throat> Good morning. <clears throat> All right, still just a couple minutes. Hey, Marissa, good to see you, Hugh, Bella, everyone else. <clears throat> Kitty? My cat's like considering jumping up here, but she decided I guess against it. <clears throat> She's like a little alarm clock, always wakes me up for these morning meetings. She doesn't like me to sleep in. Not like I really can anyway, but on the weekends, it's kind of sometimes frustrating. Hey, Emily, how, how are you? Good to see you guys. Okay, almost, <laughs> I guess it's being funny. If you guys could see, you'd understand. <clears throat> Life of a cat. Permanent quarantines, indoor kitty. <clears throat> okay. Coming right up to the last minute. <clears throat> Welcome back, everybody that's showing up. <clears throat> Be with you guys in just um, 60 seconds on this lecture. <clears throat> Everybody. Well, may as well uh, get started just right now. Um, welcome back, everyone. It's roughly 9 a.m. This is um, Wednesday, April the 15th, and we're just continuing through our notes on this uh, semester in Philosophy 101, Intro to Philosophy. Uh, right now, we are um, trying to get through the last couple of uh, articles on the topic of time. So this is something that we've been working with for a couple of uh, class periods. And uh, right now, we're in the midst of uh, analyzing the article by Ted Sider, which is just simply called Time. So the first part of today's meeting, or perhaps the bulk of it, is just going to be spent uh, getting through the remainder of the Ted Sider. So back to this man's ideas and writing. Ted, a.k.a. Theodore Sider, from a man born in 1967, and uh, we're reading something he wrote in 2005, which is just called Time. 
Um, so as a quick refresher on the stuff leading up to this, we first began with uh, the writings of Albert Einstein and uh, tried to just give a quick crash course on the theory of relativity and the idea of the relativity of simultaneity. Um, <clears throat> so it takes a while to get that fully expressed, but now that we've reviewed it a couple times, I'll just say it kind of quickly. Um, he tells you there's two lightning strikes, let's imagine, that strike on two positions of a railway track. Then imagine that they happen simultaneously. Question, what does this mean, though, uh, that they happen simultaneously? And he says you can't give, like, a weak answer, like, you know, they're just at the same time. You have to give an answer that's more precise that provides us with the um, conditions under which we could conduct an experiment to test whether the two things are simultaneous or not. We need to be able to really do a test. So uh, what's the test? He says, okay, well then let's say we put a person at the midpoint between A and B, the two lightning strikes. So this is right posed intermediate between A and B, equidistant from A and B. That's point M, where the motionless observer stands. If we say that the speed of light is constant, then if this observer sees the two events happening in the same visual perception at once, that would establish simultaneity relative to him because basically it would imply that since the two light signals reached M at the same point in time, and since they traveled at an equal velocity and covered uh, an equivalent distance given that M is the midpoint, that means that they must have departed from A and M at the origin points at the same time, so simultaneous. But if there's a second observer who's uh, traveling with velocity V on a moving train in the direction of travel towards B and away from A, then if this individual intersects with the midpoint for a split second at the same split second that the other motionless observer does their observation, then they won't see A and B happening simultaneously because given their state of velocity, they're not going to remain at rest at midpoint M, unlike the other person. So they're going to create a greater gap between themselves and the signal of light uh, emitted from A and a shorter gap between themselves and B. So basically that asymmetrical distance, the fact they're headed towards B, means that they'll receive light information to their eye before A. Uh, so they'll see B happening first. And if there was a third observer in the opposite direction of travel, they would see A happening first. So it implies this, this uh, result that the ordering of two events in space-time cannot be given an objective um, sequence. It's neither the case, objectively speaking, that they're simultaneous nor non-simultaneous. It depends on the context of the observer, their state of motion, and the uh, observed events relative to other observers. So yeah, that's really deep and weird because if that's true, then uh, what is regarded by one observer as a future event could very well be seen as an event that has already happened according to another observer's um, perspective on reality and their state of motion. Um, that therefore gives rise to all these other funny and deep perplexing paradoxes, the twins paradox, the time dilation, scenario. Um, so we talked about that. After that, we started to open up the work of Ted Sider. And that's where we're at right now. So Ted Sider just trying to explore uh, the philosophical puzzles, uh, paradoxes, conundrums, whatever, that appear to arise when you start to investigate the idea of time. One thing he says that makes time very hard for us to ask questions about is because we usually just take it for granted because uh, we're just so immersed in it all the time that we don't really think much about it. But he says we should ask these deeper questions because time is very weird when you start analyzing it beneath the surface. One thing that's strange about it, he says, is the common idea we give that time is something that moves. He says that already is a problem because trying to explain the way that time moves uh, seems to involve us in a bit of a logical circle because, okay, movement itself depends on the idea of time for it, for it to be defined, for having to even have a definition of movement, you need to make mention of time. Because for example, for like an object to move from point A to point B, it has to be at different places at different times. If it's at the same place all the time, then that's an object that stays at rest. But notice that for us to understand the concept of anything moving through even space, we have to decide, uh, we have to designate that it is at different places at different times. So if time moves, then by similar analysis, it would have to be stated that it's something which is at different places at different times. But how is time moving with reference to different times? Are these times a second order type of time? If so, then wouldn't they have to be organized within a third order sequence of time and on and on to infinity? So infinite regress is usually claimed as something impossible or logically um, 
untenable for a, you know, a philosopher or a rational person. So we seem to have difficulties expressing time moving. If we say that the present moment is moving, um, you know, like right now the present moment is 9.05 and earlier today it was 8 a.m. and later today the present moment will be noon and then three and then six. Does this give a better attempt to express the idea? And he also says not really um, because if the present moment moves, then once again, we would just be saying this, the present moment is at different places at different times. Now, once again, we're invoking the notion of time to ground the concept of time moving itself. So that's not going to work. Therefore, he says the better approach would be to just abandon this whole effort to express or analyze the concept of time moving and instead of appeal to the space time theory of Einstein. In Einstein's space-time theory, according to the results of the relativity of simultaneity, there's no movement to time at all. It simply uh, is integrated with space, and those two things jointly contain all the events in the universe, including the past, present, and future. If that is true, there's no real change, no time passing, and therefore no puzzle to be explained, because there simply isn't movement to time. Now, to give you a better handle on what is being claimed by the space-time theory and the metaphysical interpretation of it that Sider has. And we have to show you some graphs. <clears throat> so what I'm going to draw for you right now is what's called a space-time diagram. And this is going to give you a better sense of how to conceive of uh, the nature of objects and even ourselves um, according to the theory here of, of space-time and of relativity. So <clears throat> this is all still Ted Sider. But now that we know that, I'm going to erase that info. So here's a little space-time diagram. Imagine that we have here, this is our x-axis, this is our y-axis, and going through it here is what we'll call the t-axis for time. Now, um, <clears throat> I'm just trying to make it a little more perfect, but I'm getting it worse. Let me just fix that. <laughs> Sometimes your best is your first attempt, isn't it? Okay, well, anyway, there we go. Trying to make it a little bit better. Now, <clears throat> here is a so-called space-time diagram. What you see here are two spatial dimensions. Y is the horizontal axis. X is the vertical axis. And this is the time dimension that's running through. Um, now, in... A perfect world, this would be a four-dimensional graph, which would have the three spatial dimensions of height, length, and depth, and also the fourth dimension, which is the time coordinate. Um, but since this is a two-dimensional flat surface, obviously I can only work with the tools at hand. And so you need to imagine, if you could, that this is in fact the typical horizontal axis, and that this is like a three-dimensional pop-up where this time dimension runs through the coordinated other two spatial dimensions. Okay, so now to diagram the existence of objects in space-time on such a graph, we can show it like this. So let me try and diagram, for example, the existence of, um, you know, one of you. Okay, so right now it's 2020, and um, I know a lot of you guys are around freshmen or so in college. Most of you probably were born in this century. Uh, unlike me. So let's just imagine that we're dealing here with one person that was born in um, 2000, the year 2000. I know some of you are not even that old, but pretend this is one such person that's similar to your age. So <clears throat> there's the year 2000. I'm just going to put this a little further off over the right. Now, um, imagine that this person here lives a nice, full, happy uh, human life of like 100 years. So they make it out to 100. Here is 2100. That's further along on this temporal dimension. Okay, so now I'm going to diagram the graph of the person's existence on this uh, on this diagram here. So Okay, so what you see here, if you can, is a series of little, I drew just stick figures in the region which spans from the birth date or year, 2000, on to the right, 
until the, let's say, terminal point of the person's existence, 2100, as long as they exist. So on this four-dimensional um, graph, the objects stretch in different directions here. Let me try and just test your common sense comprehension of this. Why do you think that the diagram of the human life here extends, um, let's see, vertically? And why do you think that the stick figure shown is smaller uh, to the left of the graph and then increasing in height as the graph continues to the right? What do you think that represents, the vertical uh, difference in the size of the assorted figures shown on the diagram? Why do you think it is that this is a smaller figure gradually increasing in size and then sort of reaching a limit somewhere in the middle. Why do you think that is so? At least the way that this graph is drawn. What is it uh, designating that at the beginning or origin of the graph, the little human figure is uh, smaller along the x-axis? What do you think the variability uh, along that x-axis is supposed to indicate here? That height increases with age, it's exactly Q. So why is the figure seen to be small here? Because this is a newborn baby, basically. Uh, and so you're physically growing over the span of your life. You guys, of course, today are full-grown adults, and you have more mass and more height and so on than you did when you were just very small. So that is depicted in the graph by the increasing size of the figure as it goes from 2000 and then continues to the right. Another question. <clears throat> why do you think that the diagram indicates a stretched out horizontal region. We talked about growth along that X axis. Why do you think it is stretched to the right along the T axis? That's supposed to show not uh, growth over space, like becoming bigger physically. That's supposed to show a different element of the individual's existence. So what do you think that span across the T axis or dimension is indicating? Why is it extended uh, to the right in the way that you see there? So you got it right, Hugh. The, the answer given to my question, why is there greater uh, vertical extension to the figure in the middle of the graph than at the beginning? That shows the change over time of height. Why do you think that there is this streak that stretches along the T-axis? What is that supposed to show case? about the person. It's just diagramming one element of the individual object's existence, which is what? What do you think that indicates? The stretch along the T-axis. If you can hopefully still see it while Kitty's blocking it a little bit. Question for you, you gotta answer it though, tell me. What's the answer? Why is it stretched along the T-axis, please, thanks. That's lifespan, okay, good. It shows that this is an individual who has some duration to their life. So duration across time, is depicted in that part of the graph, extension along the t-axis. And um, extension through the other spatial dimensions, height and uh, width, that's demonstrated by the way that it stretches along either the x or y-axis there. Okay, so according to this kind of diagram, these space-time diagrams, um, objects like us are stretched along both the spatial and temporal dimensions. And that's why we have to have more than simply X and Y and include the addition of the T dimension there. This is sometimes called four dimensionalism when it comes to metaphysics, the view that we are composed of three spatial and one temporal dimension. On this view of objects, all objects, including us human beings, have both what are called spatial and temporal parts. So let me quickly explain and define the idea of a temporal part. Kitty, if, if you don't mind, uh, I do have this lecture going on, so maybe if I could just kind of, she's just such a handful, isn't she? Okay, come on, Kitty. Come on. Let's put you down, huh? Sorry, she's just, you know, she's a good kitty. All right, but back to what... Okay, so back to what I was doing. Um... On this four-dimensional view of objects, objects have both spatial and temporal parts. What is a temporal part? Let me give the definition and explain it to you. A 
temporal part is just an object at a single moment of time. Okay, so an object at a single moment of time. Uh, <clears throat> so looking at this diagram of a, the space-time diagram showing the existence of one human life, we see that it's stretched along that t-axis, that it has some span, which shows the duration of its existence, in this case, 100 years. A temporal part would be like one perfectly thinly sliced, deli slice, if you will, of this space-time worm or loaf. Sometimes the diagrams depicted here um, characterize the object in the graph as a space-time worm because you'll sort of see it have a worm-like um, visual appearance in the graph given that it's going to extend along this horizontal looking temporal dimension. So if we just had like one cross section of that worm-like uh, graph structure, one instant in the individual's life would be one temporal part of their um, existence. So um, a temporal part is a cross section of the space-time object in the diagram, the object at a given moment of time. So like for example, we all take photos, um, post pics and everything else. If you have a photograph of a person, a still image, Question, I guess, how many temporal parts do you think there are of the person shown in the photo? How many temporal parts are displayed in the one photographic image of a person? If you can sort of comprehend this definition, then you should be able to tell me uh, a number here. How many, number-wise, temporal parts of an individual are shown in a photo of a person? How many temporal parts is that of that person like you know still frame photo how many temporal parts does that uh, show in the photo of the person because there's a number and it's something that you can deduce just from the definition here so what do you think how many temporal parts of a person are shown in a photo of the person it's not two uh, Marissa but why do you say two though Question, Marissa, why? It's one. It's one, and uh, give me a reason, though. Why is it just one? It is one. It's one temporal part that's shown in that photo. Why, why are you giving me the right answer, one? Why is that your answer? Anyone can tell me. Why? Coordinate on the graph, the t-axis. So how many temporal parts of the individual are shown in the graph? Riley, it's correct that it's just one. But I want us to not just have the memorization. We have to have the reason. Because that is one single moment in time, correct? A photo captures an individual moment in time. It's not a video. Now, if it was a video, okay, there'd be how many temporal parts in the video? Well, there'd be as many temporal parts as there are what in that video clip? How many temporal parts are there in your life? There are just as many of them as there are what in your life? How many temporal parts uh, contain, are contained within your being? There are just as many of them. Since you've already gotten the correct answer about the photo, I'm extending that. There are as many temporal parts in your existence, right, Matthew, as there are moments in your existence. Now, what is the duration of a moment? A moment is supposed to be like the most minimal length unit of time possible. So like, you know, on a geometric line, a point is considered to have no extension and it's the minimum element of the line. And the line is composed of like, you know, in the case of geometry, infinitely many points. Uh, but in your life timeline, as it were, there are points. And each of these points could be considered a moment in that line. So according to the space-time theory, as we're looking at it here, which again presumes that all the moments of space-time are equally real, and it is not just this present moment that is real, According to that, you are fully formed as a space-time object 
completely constituted by all of your spatial and temporal parts. Now, your spatial parts are just like your body parts, okay? Like your head, your feet, hands, arms, and everything else. So the different bits of you extended in space, those are your body parts. Those are your spatial parts, as, it, as they are called. A temporal part of you is just a time point. It's a moment of your existence along the timeline through which you live. And on this idea, you are composed out of, you're literally built out of both spatial and temporal parts. The spatial parts account for your extension in space and your mass. The temporal parts account for your extension through time and the duration that you exist. <clears throat> now, a temporal part of an object is an object at a moment in time. Question about you right now, wherever you're sitting or wherever you're at. Um, how many temporal parts of you are seated in your chair right now? That's another question I wanted you to answer for me. How many temporal parts of you are seated in whatever seat you're sitting in right now? I'm asking about you, I'm making it a little personal. You, who's watching this, how many temporal parts of you are sitting down in your chair right now? How many temporal parts are there in your chair at this moment? Just think about it, but I want the answer. How many temporal parts in the chair right now? It's fine to guess, but let's see what you think. <clears throat> As many as there are moments we sit in the chair. Okay, good. I like that answer, Matthew. Um, and that's basically correct. Here's kind of what I was fishing for, that you will say there's one. Because what the moment I asked about, there was just that one. But, Matthew, you say, however many moments I'm sitting in the chair equal amount of temporal parts. Temporal parts. Correct. But, like, in a given moment of time, like right now, there's one of them. But if I ask about another moment in time, right now, for example, is it the same temporal part of you that is in the chair at this current second that I asked about, let's say, 30 seconds ago? Or is it a different temporal part? So now I'm asking a new question. Take, for example, this moment in time, which time keeps passing. So at the time that I just asked that question, there was a temporal part in your chair. Is it the same temporal part that was in your chair at the beginning of the lecture? Are those two the same temporal part or are they not? Same or different? Temporal part that is uh, hearing this question versus temporal part that heard the beginning of the lecture. Is it the same temporal part of you or is it a different one? Depending on what time we're talking about. Is the temporal part hearing this question the same as the one that heard my initial question? It's different, it's not the same. And that's correct, both Marissa and Logan. So why is there, um, why is that the right answer? Why is this person that's, or I should say part, that's hearing this new statement a different temporal part than the one I was just speaking on a moment ago? Why does the temporal part keep changing? Why is it a new one? Why is it a different one? And this can be answered in a precise way. Why then, since you seem to know, that it's not the same temporal part as was spoken of previously. Why is it a different one? Because it is a different one, yes. So just tell me the simple reason why, why that is not the same temporal part anymore. Just put that out there on the table real quick and then we can go further. Why is it a different temporal part though? We're looking at the clock, it's 9.25 a.m. How come this is not the same temporal part that I questioned about at, let's say, 9.20 a.m.? And you say this, time is passing, it's a different moment, it's a different point on the graph. Yes, because as time progresses, it's a different moment. So your temporal parts exactly are, are new for each new moment. Um, so you're kind of like this stretched out accordion of temporal parts that trace from the origins of your existence all the way through 
to the end of your overall existence. And for each new moment, there's a new temporal part that's part of that bigger sequence. Um, so there's only one of them at a time is the point. There's one of them at a time in the order of events that uh, unfolds over the course of your life. It's the same spatial size as the person, one temporal part of you. Like right now, if I could freeze time, that's one temporal part of you that's in that frozen image sitting in your seat. Um, and it's the same size as your body spatially, but it's not the same size as your existence temporally. It's just a split second in the larger scheme of all of your temporal parts located along that graph. Now, another question. It's a little trippy, but you just have to play along and think about it. Think deep, okay? It's philosophy. So um, would you say that you, you, are fully present sitting in your seat right there? Is the entire person that you are in the seat or not? That's a question that you could just give yes or no. Are you fully present in your seat? Or is it just not the whole thing that's in the seat? Which one is it? Are you completely present in your chair or not? Let me know, completely present or not completely present in your chair. And then tell me why, whatever your answer is. Are you fully, 100% present in your chair right now, wherever you're sitting? We're going to get to that, Marissa. That's the point of this question. So what's your intuition is my uh, sort of request. Do you think that you're fully present in your chair, at least as you juggle these ideas that you're trying to learn? Think about temporal parts. Think about uh, the idea of what a whole thing is according to this conception. And maybe you can give me a reasonable response. Would you say that you're fully present there sitting in your seat right now? Okay, so you're saying no, and you're on to the right idea. Why do you think that that is the way of looking at it, that you're not fully present in your chair? If you're not fully present in your chair, what is present? Well, your physical form is present in the chair, correct. You're all the spatial parts are there, but not all of the other kind of parts are there. So why is it that you're not fully present as it were? It's because sitting in your chair right now, there's how many temporal parts? One at a given moment. So what is the um, total thing that you are? What is the entire complete being that you are? On the space-time view, you are the sum total aggregate of all of your temporal and spatial parts. So what's present in the chair right now, what's hearing this lecture right now, is just one or some of the temporal parts that are a subset of your larger existence. You, the entire being, are the uh, set aggregate of all the temporal parts stretched across the timeline. So I guess according to this conception of you, you're never fully present at one given moment of time. The entire being that you are stretches across time and you therefore can only ever perceive since you perceive moments in time one at a time. You can't see the entire being that you are all at once. It's seen, I guess, only on such graphs, transtemporally. But again, the person is the sum total of all the temporal parts. So whatever part of you is listening to this lecture right now, it's just one element of it. And the temporal parts of you back when, let's say, you were like in elementary school out there, uh, you know, learning those lessons, that temporal part is also not the whole thing that you are, but just those moments in time, part of the larger timeline of your overall existence. And then take your future, okay? According to this space-time theory, all of your temporal parts are equally real. It's not just that this present moment is the only one that exists. So on the space-time theory, every moment of space-time exists. That includes everything of the past, present, and future. So whatever temporal parts of you you've yet to experience are already in some sense metaphysically real. So you have like a destiny according to this uh, approach to thinking about reality. And all the points on your timeline that lie ahead of this moment that we're in right now, they're also real. So you getting married, having children, I don't know, graduating college, um, making your big impact on society or whatever, buying a house, if you have not, all of those different things, if they happen to you, are also somewhere located along the timeline of your space-time diagram or graph, and those moments are real as well. So it's claimed by this theory that the temporal parts that you're made out of are just as real 
as your spatial parts are. So like look at your hands or whatever right now. You know, you see them and you don't doubt that they exist. Here's the left hand, here's the right hand. You can see them, you can touch them, etc. Those spatial parts, the body parts, you could just see they're real and that's obvious uh, proof. The temporal parts of you are claimed to be just as real as your physical body parts are. So like you in the year 2022, uh, two years from now, that temporal part is just as real as like your right hand is. Um, and you back in whatever, 2012, um, that temporal part of you as a young child is also something that's real and exists just equally as real as the current part of you that's taking in this lecture right now. So on this theory of time and space, reality consists of a single unified space-time which contains all of the past, present, and future. And on this idea, time doesn't move, it doesn't flow, it just sits there as one of the dimensions in this diagram, one of the coordinates in the diagram, and it's sort of just like space. Time and space jointly uh, contain all of the events that ever occur in the whole universe. Um, so I'm going to erase that a little bit and then explain a few more of Sider's ideas subsequent to this. He next says that now that we're kind of, you know, developing a deeper insight into how the space-time theory works and what it says about the existence of objects, how we are to conceive of them as having both spatial and temporal parts. Now he wants to launch into a discussion of how you got to rethink your understanding of time to fully comprehend the space-time uh, theory of Einstein. You have to start to think of time as having a little bit more in common with space than you normally think. So time is more like space on this view, and here are three main similarities between time and space according to the space-time theory. <clears throat> but before I erase this, I'm just wanting to look at this one more time. Um, now, if there was an object that just existed for a single moment and then ceased to exist or annihilated itself, then it wouldn't have this stretch along the t-axis. It would just be a single point along that axis. Maybe, you know, like there are particles that can get instantly annihilated by antimatter and stuff. Um, so, you know, there could be examples like those. But thankfully for me and you, we have more than just a moment of time that we do exist, and thus our diagram demonstrates that by having this streak rather than a single slice. Um, there's a lot of interesting like time travel movies and stuff that, that are wise to these um, theories. Um, I would say anybody who's really interested in it, you might someday watch Donnie Darko's super weird movie, but um, there's like some scenes where you can see projected from the person's chest this uh, kind of worm-like world line. And metaphysicians have sometimes said that you can think about the graph of your existence as proceeding in a world line. It's kind of almost like a trail, like a trail of motion that if you could see it in visual space, it would have led you to the seat that you're in right now. And then according to what you're gonna do next when you get up and you know walk around your house or I don't know, walk your dog or something, that world line can be seen projected from your current point to all the remaining uh, dis destinations that you'll be traveling in the future. And the whole world line is fully set. So if you cut like one deli slice through the world line, you'd see the person's existence at that single moment in time. Um, okay, so how is time similar to space? Let's talk about three similarities. <clears throat> Three similarities between time and space according to Ted Sider and according to the space-time theory. Okay. So one of these three main similarities is in terms of reality, okay? Um, so you're saying this, Marissa, quick question. So people are just points moving down a line in this case. You know, you are an object which has got temporal parts. There's no movement though. Uh, the movement is an illusion uh, generated by your consciousness. The entire system is fully set out there. So that's kind of a weird idea, but according to this theory, yes, all the moments, 
that jointly constitute your past, present, and entire future are all real. And so uh, the point in the, I guess, um, uh, assembly line process of your existence playing out is, you know, you're in your current year, uh, you're whatever, 18 or 19 or 20, and you have a lot of time ahead of you, I'm assuming, as long as everything goes well. And all you're going to see is the playing out of events as it's already established to happen by the objective existence of all the temporal parts that uh, constitute or compose your overall existence. So I don't know if you should say that your point's moving down a line, but you are a sequence of temporal parts stretched out like an accordion from the duration of your birth all the way through to your death. Now, the first similarity between time and space, according to this theory, is claimed to be in terms of reality. Okay, and so I'm going to give a quick little description of what that means. Objects that are far away in space are just as real as ones that are close in space. And the same is true of events in time. Okay? Just as real as objects that are present in space. And the same is true of time. Same goes for time. Okay, so let me explain this point really fast. Um, <clears throat> here, look at this marker. Now, this demonstration works a lot better when we're all in the classroom, because I could be like, look, we're all in this classroom, and you see this exists. But um, maybe as a substitute, just take something that's in your own immediate environment. Like, I don't know, here's something that will work. I know you're looking at some type of device to watch this. So say this device that you're watching it on, the computer monitor or tablet or, you know, maybe probably not ideal viewing conditions, but your smartphone, whatever. Say you're watching this. I know you're watching it on something if you're even seeing this. So take that viewing device. Um, is it real? Okay, let's not worry about Descartes and all those skeptical uh, authors. Let's just say for the sake of common sense, yes, it's real. You're looking at it. But here I have a question. What if the computer monitor uh, or device that you're looking at was to be removed from where you're at, you know, you stay in the quarantine, you're staying in your house or room, and uh, this computer that you're currently staring at, let's say that it is removed and it's taken over to the Chapman University while you stay at home. Now you're at home and this computer has been placed in a different area, farther away from you. Right now it's present to you. Right now it's present, it's right in front of you. But say that I take it however far away over to Chapman. Question, would it still be real? when it's not right next to you, but some distance away, like say at Chapman. Would your computer still exist and still be real if all we did was just move it in space from where you're at right now over to the university? Would it still exist? Would it still be real if it was that far away and you were not with it anymore, so you're separated in a space from it? Would it still be real? I mean, question. Simple question, what do you think? Would the computer you're looking at now still be real if it was like, I don't know, 30 miles away from you or however, however far away Chapman is from you? Yes, it would still be real. And I hope that's just clear and obvious. It's not like uh, things stop existing when you don't have a uh, physical presence towards them. OK, so, you know, I exist. I exist even though I'm farther away from you than I used to be during the class lectures that were all happening in one room. OK, now, if I continue to extend this question and answer uh, a little further. Let's go that direction. Take your computer that you're looking at now. Say that I had the means to uh, put it in a rocket and zoom it far away from the Earth. So I take your computer and I send it towards the moon. Now it's up there on the moon near the whatever American flag on the lunar surface. Is it still real while you're back here on the Earth? And the computer, I didn't remove it just to Chapman. Now I've taken it on a much further uh, trip all the way out to the moon. Does it still exist though? 
And I'll just give you the reasonable answer that I'm, I'm sure you understand, which is that yes, it still exists. And uh, no matter how far I play with this question, what if I take it to the Mars? What if I take it outside the Milky Way galaxy? What if I take it on the, the Voyager space shuttle and get it into interstellar space all the way outside of our solar system? Does it still exist as it's getting farther and farther from you? And the answer is obviously yes. So a thing that is right up in your face, present to you in space, close, that's real, and you know it because you can look at it. But as it gets removed from you further and further, it doesn't cease to exist or cease to be real. It's not like distance in space can affect how real or whether a thing exists or not. Okay, so it's, it exists when it's up close, and it exists when it's at any remove away, no matter if that's a close remove or a very distant one. So that's the reason that this first part of the claim here has been written. Objects that are far away in space are just as real as the objects that are close up and present in space. So that doesn't change how real they are, how far away they are spatially. All this is saying is that the same thing is true about time. So events in time are just as real whether they're happening presently or whether they're happening at a distant moment of time relative to now. So right now it's like 9.42 a.m. and we're doing this lecture. And this is, of course, real, and we can tell that. But according to the space-time theory, uh, let's say you graduating from Chapman, which obviously by definition hasn't happened yet, uh, given that it will happen, that future moment, years ahead of you right now, it's also just as real as this present moment is. So according to this idea, moments in time that are distant from now are just as real as the current moment is. So distance in space or time has no effect on the reality of objects or events. And likewise, in the other direction of the past, you back in high school, starting your first day uh, of high school as a freshman, that moment in space time is just as real as you listening to this lecture right now. So according to this idea, there's no at all truth to the thought that the present moment is the only moment that really exists. I find that interesting because it really uh, completely destroys a lot of inspo motivational quotes that are sometimes to me just a little bit annoying, like, you know, seize the day, it's all that really exists, the future is wide open, the past is gone, embrace the now, it's all that's real. According to this space-time theory, this is all false. We're replacing what's called presentism here with eternalism. So all the moments in time have equal status of being real. And the current moment that you happen to be experiencing is not the only one that's actually real. So when we talk about distant events in time, sometimes we employ spatial metaphors. Like sometimes you'll say, remember back then when I was a child? Back, like implying behind me, as though you're making a journey through space. And sometimes when you anticipate the future, you say, I wonder what it's going to be like um, way out there in the future. Uh, ahead of me. So you're talking almost as though it's a journey and a forward direction, those future events will happen. So on the space-time theory, they're all equally real, not just the ones that are currently located in space or time, but the ones that are located at any distance from you in space and time. They're all just as real. So the dinosaurs existing way back then, and the end of the coronavirus, maybe out in the future, all those events are just as real as you sitting here listening to this lecture. So that's one similarity between time and space that is an implication of the space-time theory. And that's something that he mentions to us here. But there's two more. So next up. The next one is something that we briefly kind of discussed just now. And that's what he says in terms of parts. <clears throat> so the second similarity is in terms of parts. So in terms of parts, what he means by this is that um, objects take up space by having spatial parts. And um, objects occupy time by having temporal parts. So that's another similarity in terms of parts. So objects occupy space by having spatial parts, like you're seated, seating in a chair right now, occupying the chair because you have the body parts that you have. Um, and likewise, 
objects occupy time, by having those temporal parts. Okay, so that's the second similarity proposed between time and space, that in both cases there are parts. In space, we have got uh, spatial parts, physical parts, like in the case of this table, one part of it is the surface, another part of it are the legs. Um, and likewise, when it comes to thinking about objects not just taking up some space in a room, but time over the course of time, we say that that is accounted for by them having temporal parts. And once again, these temporal parts are claimed to be not just fictional things that are used by speculative theories, but real. So your temporal parts are just as real as your physical body parts are now. Um, and then the third similarity. So we'll get to that with just a minute left. Um, and I may have to resume on this point at the next lecture so that we don't just kind of rush it, but I want to at least hint at it for now. And the third similarity that the author does discuss is in terms of the words here and now. Okay, so the explanation for this similarity is that both of these are what we would call relative terms, and their meaning depends on the context of, of speech. So they depend on where or when the word is used. Both of these are relative terms. whose meaning depends on the context of the speaker. Okay, so let me explain, or at least start the explanation. Context of the speaker. Okay, so look, here is a perhaps deceptively simple question. Where is here? Where is the location called here? When someone uses the word here, where are they talking about? Where is that place? Can you tell me? Where is here located at? Where will I find that? Anybody have an idea? Tell me how to get to here. Where is here? Where is it? Got to be somewhere. Where is it? Where is here? word here, you ever heard that? What does here refer to? It does refer to the location of the speaker, good. It's kind of a trick question, so I don't want you to be too thrown, but obviously there's no single universal uh, objective place which is called here. It's wherever the speaker is at. So if I say to you, um, my cat is here, that's true in the context of my speech, because when I say here, I'm referring to the local area surrounding me, the speaker. Um, but of course, if, if you say, no, there's no cat here, uh, and say you don't have a cat, that may very well be true relative to your context of speech, because in that case, you're the speaker and here doesn't refer in your speech to my location, but the location at which you spoke the word. So notice therefore that the word here, it's relative terming in terms of where it refers to. If I say, um, here in this state, we don't have the worst case of coronavirus and someone in New York says, here we actually have the worst case in this country. We seem to be contradicting each other, but we're not referring to the same place because here spoken in the speech of a person on the West Coast refers to our area. Here spoken of in the speech of the East Coast refers to their area. So we use the same word, but it refers to the different areas depending on the location of the speaker. Now we got more to say on this, but that's the same with time basically and the word here, uh, sorry, and the word now. When is the moment now? Well, there's no single universal location or time point when now it happens. Now is just whenever the word is spoken. So if I say now the lecture's ending, I'm talking about mm, 9.50 a.m. on Wednesday. But uh, in an hour when I finish my next lecture and I say now we're ending, that's not referring to this time because then I'm speaking at a different point in the time stream. 
So just like the word here, the word now is a relative term. And that is something that some people would have thought differently about if they thought it had an objective significance. Uh, so three similarities between time and space, just wrapping up the work of Ted Sider. We have a little more on him, and then I also want you guys to read David Lewis for Friday and the paradoxes of time travel. And once we finish with Lewis on Friday, we'll be all done with this. And then next Monday, we'll start talking a little bit about the essay prompt for the next uh, second essay. So anyways, uh, for now, anyway, uh, have a great one. Stay safe, healthy, and everything else. And I'll see you guys back on Friday for our next lecture. Just finish reading Ted Sider and look at David Lewis, and then we should be all good to go um, for the next you know, batch of meetings. Okay, everyone, so take care again. Thank you so much for being here, and um, have a great one. I'll see you on Friday. Mm-hmm. <clears throat>